Okay, so good evening again, everyone. Um, this is the part of the evening that the geek in me is super excited about. I've been stalking you on RTS, watching all your reports. Um, all my colleagues will know that I've, um, I'm, I, the, the report that you did on um, the use of playground space is something that I've brought into ISL, and it's a complicated uh, problem to resolve, but we're working on it. So Eglantine Jamé is someone, that, an expert that I go to as the gender equity leader within the school to look for, for information, advice, and insights, particularly here in Switzerland. So I'm really honoured uh, to be here, uh, kind of uh, on stage with you, but definitely following you. And, um, and I'm really pleased that you are all here um, to hear and, and learn and dive into um, some of the issues in um, unconscious bias that relates to the challenges that the um, women that we had here before were discussing. So um, without further ado, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'd like you to just take a moment to read this scenario. Take a moment to reflect on it. And then I'd like you to think about um, what influenced your response. What could be going on in that scenario? Could you now discuss with the person, uh, person next to you um, and then um, these three questions, and then we're going to ask you to share with us what your thoughts are after that. So you've got a couple of minutes to discuss. Okay, could I draw you back in? And could I ask um, a volunteer to share with me what you think uh, might have influenced your response? Anyone want to be brave enough to share with us? It is quite a common one. We did debate it. Um, did anyone else, anything else come up for anyone else when you're thinking about what the distinction is between um, explicit and implicit bias? John? I think, you know, I've seen that many times before. When I, that word surgeon, I, I can't use the strokes, but when I think of the surgeon, I would think of the man. Yeah, and that's what, even in the context that we're here in an event talking about, um, you know, women in leadership positions, women in STEM careers, it's so hard um, to unblock your, your brain from going down that, that pathway. Um, so let's move on to thinking about why. Thanks. Um, and good evening. I'm very happy to be, to be here with you tonight. Um, I think the riddle that you, that you, the story that you read, um, what is interesting is that when it's been used on the street to ask people what was the possible explanation to this story, many people go to very complicated explanations. Just because their brain cannot come up with the obvious solution that the surgeon is the mother, and this is because of the association that we have when our brain goes very quickly to our past experience, to 
the cliché or the images or the common experiences we've gone through. And this is very much linked to our beliefs, our education, and the po very partial experience of the world that we have. And this is what a bias is. A bias is a cognitive, spontaneous, unconscious response that comes when you don't really have time to ponder, when you don't really have time to reflect, when you don't really have time to go beyond this first association that comes through your brain and that is also very much linked to your memory. Um, so the first very important thing to remember is that everybody has biases. It's not that because you're more intelligent or more scientific or more rational or because you've studied for very long that you have less biases than other people. It's just the natural response your brain gives when it goes quickly. And fortunately, I mean, we have to make decisions every single minute on our way. We have to know how to adapt to this situation very quickly. So yes, we have a rapid brain. The problem is our rapid brain is biased. And very often we are not aware of that. So just being conscious of those biases, of the fact that when we think quickly, the perception of our reality is distorted, is extremely important. And as you can see, you have an, amazing, an amazingly long list of biases. So they're not always linked to gender, obviously. They're not always linked even to stereotypes or um, kinds of, of people. They're linked to every single minute of your life. Um, a very common one, just, give you an example, just to give you an example, um, is the fact that you very often overestimate the agreement of the others with what you think. It's called the consensus bias. You think that because, I don't know, you're very fond of uh, um, trying to fight for a better environment and prevent the use of chemicals that destroy the environment, then you your friends probably have the same sort of ideas. You read articles that also support those ideas. And then you have the bias to think that most of the population probably agrees with you. And then there's a vote, and you find out that the majority of the population has voted against what you thought was the common observation that everybody made. So this is the consensus bias. It's just a small example, but just to say that biases are everywhere and constantly. Then... Um, where we have a problem that is linked to our topic tonight is when the bias comes as um, a way of applying a stereotype to a whole social category. So it can be young people, older people, it can be people from different origins, it can be obviously boys and girls or men and women. Your brain makes a mental category which is perfectly normal just because it's the way you analyze reality you need to go fast again so you make a mental category but then if you go quickly you're going to associate probably a stereotype so a common idea or a cliche uh, about this category and the problem with the bias is when you just see the person through this lens because it can end up discriminating. And I'll give you an example that is not linked to gender again to, to explain that it's really something that goes way beyond this if you think teenagers are lazy, and you're talking to Kevin, who's uh, training to do uh, a very uh, important competition in um, running, you're not going to see Kevin as a sporty person because you're going to be in your mental stereotype that Kevin is a teenager and then Kevin is lazy and he's probably on the couch every day playing video games. And so this is going to impair the way you perceive him and what you can trust him with what he can do. So again, it's a normal process, but it's important to be aware of it to fight it. Then what do you think are the main gender biases? If we were to think very openly, who would like to have a go at this one? Yeah. Pink, okay, so differences in colors. Strength, associating men with being stronger and then women with being weaker. Okay, here we have sensitivity, associating women with being more sensitive. Sorry? Nurture. Nurture. 
Yeah, absolutely, which goes kind of in the same direction as well. Authority. Authority. So here you mentioned qualities um, that may make us think that being a man and being a woman gives us different natural inclinations or potentials or tastes or competences. And this is exactly what gender biases are in, indeed. So I would like to show you uh, an experiment that you may also have already encountered that was carried out um, and, and filmed by the, by the BBC in, in England. Do you like a dolly? Shall we go for the dolly? There's a good girl. You're a good little girl, aren't you, Sophie? Look, what does this say? Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. Ooh, look at this, Sophie. She like that pink pink dolly the best. If I were to tell you actually that Sophie is Edward, ah, does well, that change anything? I maybe thought, oh, this is a little girl, so I have to give her little girl things. Solo, solo, hello, hello. Come on. What's this one? Oh, what's that one do? Is that a robot? What about this? Oh, you like that one? What does this one do? Oliver, Oliver. You've gone for, you could say, boy toys for possibly, this boy. Possibly, in my subconscious, but for me, I was just going for what was around me, but then perhaps my subconscious was automatically playing a trick on me. That I was if I tell you that he is actually a girl. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. I suppose it's because of the stereotype. And then that changed your behaviour yes, towards the did. child. Yes, it did. And your behaviour was lie. quite yeah, directive. Did. One, two, three. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Do you want to see my robot? She's picked up the robot, the car, the puzzle game. I think she's been much more physical in handling the child than the other adults have been with girls. That really astounded me because I thought that I was somebody that had a really open mind. The surprise, um, so I automatically went for the, the pink, pink fluffy toy because I see it was a girl, so, so I was sort of stereotyping. I've always thought I was rather more open-minded that, than that, and I would think, you know, ch these are children's toys, whatever the gender. It will make me think uh, the next time I'm with a child, so my, my niece or my nephew, to make sure that I am actually being sort of fair <laughs> and equal with all of them, uh, and just giving each child an opportunity to just be whoever they are. I don't know if someone wants to share a reaction to the video. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I don't know if you had time to read the captions that were saying that the brain actually changes depending on what sort of activity children practice, but it's really something that we also have to take into account because in, um, in a child's brain, you only have 10% of the connections that are already mature at birth, and all the rest is going to be done depending on what the child will experiment, how you talk to them, the kind of toys they play with, and, and all the experiences that they will uh, make in the first years of their lives. 
So this is a very brief summary of what everybody can sort of laugh at and say, yes, but it's not true. We know, of course, that you know, we're not going to give little girls only dolls and pink and, and tell them to, to uh, become uh, dancers and uh, nurses. Of course, we're all aware that, no, of course, we don't do that. But as you can see in the video, it's a bit more complicated than that. And also, even if as parents we're not, we don't agree with that sort of stereotyping, then we live in a society where the toys are gender targeted, where the friends are going to say, yes, yes, I want to do ballet and not football, or I want to do football and not ballet, depending on which gender we're talking about. So this is actually the, pla the, different, the two different planets on which our kids live very often. And some of you may think it's no longer the case, but there are actually also new marketing um, um, tools which go even further in the fact that they are targeting either boys or girls just to sell more, but with um, um, a lot of, um, a lot of um, different qualities that are promoted. I always give this example of the bike because I think it's just so... Um, it's self-explanatory uh, that when you buy, a, when you were buying a bike for a child in the 70s or 80s, probably you would buy um, a red bike that wasn't labeled either girls or boys. Today, if you want to buy a bike for a five-year-old child in a shop, you will probably have two different versions. Very often, the girl's bike is also more expensive. Um, very often, it's pink. Um, very often it has their favorite cartoons on it. But this is not so, this is not such a big problem if, if it were just this. The problem is that the girl's bike very often comes with a baby seat and a basket. And the boy's bike comes with um, something to change the gears and a horn. Because on the one hand, you have a champion's bike, and on the other hand, you have a mummy slash um, um, housewife bike. So it's not at all the same sort of prescription that you give children. And you do this unconsciously, of course, just because your child wants the, the frozen bike or the, or the Spider-Man's bike. But this is what we call in social science um, the hidden curriculum. What children learn without no one noticing without anyone noticing. This afternoon, we're going to draw people doing different jobs. And the first job we're going to draw is a firefighter. Okay. Have a think in your head what a firefighter looks like. Oh, okay. What's your firefighter called? Mine's called Firefighter Gary. Firefighter Stan. <laughs> firefighter Simon. He's big and strong. He's got a big helmet on. That's brilliant, isn't it? Next, we're going to draw a surgeon. Have you thought of a name for your surgeon? Jim Bob. Jim Bob. He's a brain surgeon. I think he would wear a stethoscope. He gives you medicine. That's his ambulance. OK, next, we're going to draw a fighter pilot. Yes. This is his jet plane. He rescues people. He likes to do stunts in the air and stuff. OK, now, who would like to meet these people for real? Yeah. My name's Tamsin and I'm a surgeon in the NHS. My name's Lauren and I'm a pilot in the Royal Air Force. My name's Lucy, I'm a firefighter in the London Fire Brigade. So who wants to know how to do an operation? <gasps> Who's putting it on? I'm trying my stethoscope. Oh, we put this in here. What does it look like? There you go. Now you're a proper fighter pilot. So into your ears. Can you hear that? Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, it's much better than, yeah, it's much better than my kids Mine's one. Got So as an academic counsellor at the International School of Lausanne, 
I'm currently spending my days um, speaking to the year 11 students and asking them about their choices and asking them about what they might like to do in the future. And I see this every day. I see the boys coming in and wanting to be computer scientists and wanting to be engineers. And I see the girls wanting to go into caring, the caring professions. And it's not, it's not always, but it's so, it's so noticeable and it's that I can see it in our data. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're here, here today, because being uh, somebody that's also got a few wrinkles, I'm also aware of so many of our friends and so many uh, people um, that, that find themselves in something that they actually didn't want to do and that they're, they're there for another reason. Um, so within the gender equity group at the International School of Lausanne, a couple of years ago, um, we did a, a project to look into attitudes towards STEM. Here are some of the comments uh, from our students. I'll give you a moment to read them. So, uh, yeah, there, I'll maybe need to explain a little bit of International Baccalaureate Speak. So, uh, DP stands for the Diploma Programme, and within um, the, the final two years of, of our school, the students do a project um, where they can choose something that's of interest to them, and then they have to investigate it and come up with, with a presentation. So, this was um, the, the project that they do within the Diploma Programme, or one of them. <laughs> So you can see um, the, the students themselves, so within this year group, we had a lot of girls who were um, very interested in pursuing science. Um, they identified that it had come through from having parents that were already involved with STEM. And they could actually, they'd identified within their own year group that there were the, their friends that weren't um, going opting for taking uh, double sciences or the, the harder, like, or, or, or taking uh, physics and so on, often and just didn't have exposure. Um, so this evening's event goes right back to um, them, them telling me, Miss, we need some more, we need some more role models. We need to uh, share the wonder of, of STEM. So we wondered if now you could, um, again, just turn to your partner and share an example of your own experience of bias and stereotyping on your educational journey or perhaps within the context of your career. And then also discuss biases which might impact education and career choices and decision making. We'll give you another two minutes for that. Okay, could I? Could I pull you back in? Would anyone like to share an example um, with us for the first question? Any bias or what kind of bias and stereotyping could affect these choices? Thank you. Um, I was working as a solicitor uh, in a firm in uh, Yorkshire when I got married. And one of the senior partners said to me, so when you get married, Orla, will you be leaving us? And that's not, it was 25 years ago. Yeah, so uh, assuming uh, marital status. Um, what else? Uh, did it, yeah, over here. Well, last uh, teachers uh, in school were, uh, uh, were men, so and, and not teachers as well. So Yeah, so that could be. So there's a, a double a double scenario of not having the encouragement that you needed, but also not being able to see the role models within within mathematics, which is quite off putting. Um, anyone else? Yes. Um, I'm a professor in a business school and I teach executives and I would say 
85% of my, my students are men. So it, it, that reinforces it because then you have, um, you know, and my job is leadership development, teaching leadership, and so then, as, then you're not teaching enough women even at the executive leadership level, so then it kind of ends up in a negative spiral. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what about the, um, the second, like how do these biases impact on uh, education choices and career decision making? What do you think? Well, I know for myself, like I assumed that I could no longer run the international recruitment team at the University of Edinburgh when I had my twins. It felt very hard um, to travel. I didn't think about how I could possibly reimagine the job. I just thought this, you know, I need to change what I do to accommodate my children. And I went like, while well, my husband and I approach um, parenting very equitably, um, it, it, it had an impact, a huge impact uh, on my career. What else? What other impacts can it have? Yes. So with the Swiss laws, it was pretty clear that I wouldn't get much into the early education of my kids. Yeah. One day, like that, and now we need 14 days, but it's even like compared to four months of the government. Yeah, so that bias that exists that, that mothers are the nurturers and that fathers are the providers are written into the laws around us, which then hold us into this system. Um, and uh, yeah, which yeah, can be very frustrating for, for new parents. Okay. Let's leave this one. Just one more. And I think there is a... A word that uh, has been pronounced also with the presentations of the role models, that is a key word, choice. Because when we listen to stories, very often that the word, it's the word that comes. Yes, but she chose to reduce um, her workload. She chose to take a job that was less demanding. She chose to work part-time to raise her kids. Um, the problem is the lack of choice given the system we live in. And when I speak of this lack of choice, I'd like it to be really in an inclusive way that includes men and women, boys and girls. Because it's not that working in a scientific, technical world is better than being a carer, but it's more valued. It's better paid. So what happens is that we live in a society where everything that is on the side that is recognized as traditionally masculine, even though, of course, this is just what we inherited. Nobody who lives on Earth today decided that. But we do have this hierarchy between the qualities, the competences, the spheres, even the sports. I mean, if you compare soccer and ballet, it's pretty obvious. And uh, a sociologist sometimes says that if we were living in a society that had inherited the fact that um, ballet was a boy's activity and soccer a girl's activity, given the hierarchy that exists, then on TV we would have ballet competitions all the time. The sponsors would fight to pay for um, the, the special uh, clothes, etc. And we would have the ballet dancers being paid millions and, and, and soccer being some, some sort of not very popular game, kind of a bit silly and really something for girls. So this hierarchy, again, even if things are slowly evolving, is still there, and it's very much present in the jobs, and it's very much present in the share of paid work and unpaid work, which is carried out by people. Yeah? Money is following the fact that there are 
Yeah, but you, you, I think you're partially right with the attraction of the sport, but I think maybe we underestimate also what we have been used to watching. And what we have been used to seeing is something positive, exciting, cool. Yeah. Um, I give you the example of painting. Um, the, the, the reviews of art uh, have always um, made these metaphors about colour and drawing. And in the reviews of art in the 19th century, when drawing in classical painting was the most important component of a painting, um, the drawing was the masculine uh, component of the painting, and the colour was the feminine component, because it was more seen as accessory. At the beginning of the 20th century, cubism appears, fauvism, I'm not sure you say this in English, or vism, a painting current that is very much colourful. And all of a sudden, the colour becomes the primary component of the painting. And in the reviews of art at the beginning of the 20th century, the colour is the masculine component of the painting, and the drawing is the feminine component. And I just think, perhaps you cannot transfer this to anything, but very often we think it's because it what it represents, but it's just because it has values, that it's more labelled masculine or feminine. And there are tons of examples that are like that. So, um, yeah. Thanks anyway for the comment. And uh, just coming back to this, it's just to show also that, of course, the system self reproduces. Because if children are brought up and socialized and educated with a lot of biases interfering with how they grow up, they um, acquire what in sociology you call really distinct. Um, capitals, distinct social capitals in terms of learnings and models. And of course they also have different kinds of role models to identify to and they develop different competences. And this is exactly what we've been seeing in the video about uh, the firefighters and the pilots and the surgeons. And it's exactly the work also that is being done by this association model with, with, with women um, from various kinds of jobs coming in the class discussing with the children and it's everything we've been told in the previous presentations about the fact that you cannot you cannot dream of becoming what you don't see but of course you make then choices that are very much dependent on all the competences you've acquired and all the models that you have watched and this is again when the word choice comes um, when and if I speak of my personal experience, I remember uh, my grandmother telling me very often that a very good job for a woman was to be a teacher, because then you had the same holidays and the same timetable as your children, and it was the best you could dream of. And if I um, imagine what was uh, desirable when I was a little girl, having a family and having children was extremely desirable. And I remember talking to um, friends of mine, male friends of, friends of mine, about how we were brought up. And they were saying, no, but I think really my parents have brought me up really exactly the same as if I had been a girl, no difference. And then I said, okay, have you ever wondered when you were a child or a teenager, the kind of career that you would choose that would be okay to be balanced with the family life you wanted to have? Something that was possible to reconcile both. And then they looked at me and they were like, no, I never wondered about this. I just went for what I liked. I just thought it would be interesting to study this or perhaps a very nice and interesting job to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or that I could make a lot of money or that I could be someone important or that I could have power or be the boss. Those are things I never thought about. Maybe I was brought up in a traditional environment, but today there have been studies carried out in Switzerland saying that when asked um, how do you project yourself in your professional life, girls aged 13 year, year old um, were saying, well, I think I will work 60%. Well, this is a very original thing to answer when you're asked how do you see yourself in your professional life. Because if you work 60%, there's a good chance that you won't be able to support yourself alone. So it means your plan is A, to have a partner, B, that your partner earns enough money to partially support you, 
and see that probably the most important thing or the most desirable thing that you want to achieve in life is not necessarily work, but it's also being able to be something else, perhaps a mother. And this is, of course, very good. I mean, we're never saying that it's better to dream of being rich and having power than having children. Of course not. But the reality is that the desires are not stimulated in the same proportion in boys and girls. And what happens very often is that then when you come to personal family and career choices, you reproduce exactly what you were brought up in. And this creates inequality, inequality of status. And you all know there are about um, between 80 and 90% of men in the sea suits um, and, and uh, management roles in, in Switzerland. That's what you said about your students. Um, and on the other side, you have, um, I think it's 80% of mothers of under six who work um, with very part-time roles because also the law doesn't um, do much to favor uh, work-life balance and uh, the government doesn't invest much in, in nurseries and all that. But this, of course, is going to reproduce how much people earn, how independent they can be financially, and who is the primary carer in the family, and so who is going to be the model for the title. And there is one thing that is very important, and I can tell you it's true, because I have experienced it also with my children. Children do not care what you tell them. <laughs> they know what they see. So you can be the best champion of gender equality in your speech. If you're doing 90% of the domestic chores, if, if you're the one taking them to school every morning and get, getting them, well, in the morning, usually dads can do it, but getting, a, getting them early or bringing them to the activities is something different. But they know what they see, so they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And also, it's very unconscious. They reproduce what they see, what is desirable. What is desirable for them is to be like the adults they admire and they love. So it's important, again, to, to be aware that this is turning around and around. The, the, sorry, the question is what exactly? The first story that we read about the surgeon and the, um, and the yeah. son. Yeah. If you ask that in a class now with younger children, what do you think the answer would be? I think the depressing thing is that the biases are, are there as heavily as they were when we were young, that it's not changing. And that's, um, it's not changed, nothing, none of this, the system that uh, Dr. Shami just showed us will shift unless we, we actively deconstruct it and, and make it shift. Um, so I don't see any change. Um, as Dr. Shami was talking there, I was thinking about the, um, having met recently with the director at UNIL uh, of the psychology department, and she was talking, she was lamenting that um, after the propos didactique, uh, the, the foundation year within the, the, the social science degree at UNIL, um, the, the vast majority of students that opt for psychology are girls for the same reason that they're expecting a, a career that's more part-time. Part I was reflecting on, you know, the fact that I see the young boys coming in and feeling already this pressure that they've got to be the providers and they've got to be the earners. So they've got to get, they've got to be leaders. They've got to be managers. You know, they've got to work in finance um, without, oh, I'm afraid I can't take music because I need to earn money. You know, I need to provide for my family. So um, there's, there's, I see all these stories and, and all these um, situations, all these individuals who are trapped within the, the biases um, around us. Can I just say something? Please, Please Mary. Mary. So I've been working with the Cantonal Commission for Equality here in Canton of Rome. And for the last, I was on the commission for, six, for eight years. And one of the things that we've been doing very strongly is working uh, or trying to push the organizations who are in charge of the teaching, the public school system, to train the trainers, to train the teachers, to work with the primary school teachers, to work with the secondary school teachers, because if the teachers 
don't see their own bias, then they can catch them. We just perpetuate it. Um, You're absolutely right, and there's a huge job to be carried out in all the HOP where they train the teachers about that. Yeah, absolutely. So globally, what we're seeing now is that girls outperform boys at every level of school um, and at university too. And the only area where they're underrepresented is in the STEM fields at university. Um, what children are asked to do conforms with the social conditioning of girls, not boys. And so going back to our earlier um, thinking about, you know, the, the behaviours that we're encouraging in girls versus boys, the toys that we're asking them to, to play with um, without being aware of our own biases, the, the balls that we're throwing uh, towards them, the dollies that we're handing out, they have an impact on the brain development and the, the um, and then the how the behaviour comes in through school. Yeah. What is interesting about what you just said, Katrina, is that girls outperform boys at school, but then in the corporate world, this is no longer true. And it's very interesting to notice that actually the way what what school asks children to do which is to stay still, to listen, to be nice, to work um, devotely. And, and, and I don't know, when you do drawing, you shouldn't um, put any color outside of your, of, of your, of your drawing when you do coloring. And, and you should listen to the teacher and you should try to be a good student and be nice, etc. This is very much in adequation with how girls are brought up. So of course, they're like a fish in the water at school. And on the other hand, when boys are more stimulated to be a bit boisterous, to show that they're real boys, to, to play outside, to run around, also to be silly, to be funny, not to follow the orders because you make your pals laugh when you say something stupid in class. They don't like... I mean, a boy at school very often is not, real, is not popular at all or even he can be harassed if he works well and he's a nice boy. What the other boys like, popular boys, are those who are a bit rebel. And, well, so at school it's more difficult for boys. But then, in a company, if you're doing your job well without telling anyone and just being a good student, someone who's nice and who doesn't make any noise, there's a good chance you will never be promoted. Whereas your colleague, who's also doing a great job, but I mean, you know, he's comfortable, He's loud, he boasts about his successes. There's a good chance that he will be more visible when there's an opening for a promotion. And this is, of course, very much of a caricature, the way I'm telling it now, because it's to simplify things. But it's interesting to see how the codes and the way you give awards, you give um, a recognition to someone, is, are completely different at school and in the corporate world, but that they match very differently um, how we were brought up. Isn't that rather a problem of school? To not train the students how to get their foot down in the corporate world? Yeah, I think you're, you're right. It's partially the problem. Uh, but being caring and not being centered on your ego and your success is also something that should be learned at school, but it should be learned by everyone, not just by 50% of the people and something else. I mean, we do have those testimonies of, of teachers who say very openly, because they don't realize that the problem, that, well, you know, it's easier with girls, they follow, they listen, so I let them work together and I focus on boys. But when you do that, you actually discriminate people, you actually create inequality. And also, you're not being there for Sarah, who's in the group of girls, but who's not at all uh, focused or, or who doesn't like it. And the same thing when you tell boys to go run outside because it's raining and girls prefer to stay in. You know? and, but this, those are current examples in, in, in Switzerland in 2023. And teachers do it because they think it's good. Because they are not aware that they are just reproducing something and being biased. So yes, we need to learn to speak up. We need to learn to be more assertive. We need to learn a lot of 
soft skills, whatever they're called. We also need to learn to be caring and work collectively and uh, be courageous. This is courage is something that is crucially lacking in leadership roles today. Um, I, I, my job um, is to, I co-founded a company which is called Artemia, who is doing executive search and consulting in companies in order to have more gender balance in the top jobs. And what is really sad is to see the, the, the way men and women cannot make those choices and cannot be full human beings with a set of competences and qualities that, is just, that are just human and not male or female. So you do have, um, I, mean, I mean, the problem is you do have a way of looking at people that includes those, those biases. Just coming back to the choice of career, because I think it's also uh, one of the direct reasons why um, it's important to promote girls in STEM, but also just very broadly to open up their horizons. When you look at this, one thing you see very clearly is it's very rare to have um, a choice that is balanced with men and women. Um, you only have commerce, sales, that is a little bit balanced. All the rest is either in majority of gray for boys or blue for girls. But the other thing that you may not notice at first glance is that girls choose from a very tiny, um, pro they choose from much fewer different sections than boys. I think the last um, statistics I found was something that there are 300, more than 300 different options when you want to start uh, studying in Switzerland in terms of types of sectors. And 80% of girls choose out of 30 of those 300 jobs. So you also have a lack of variety and they are overrepresented, obviously in all the caring, health, um, education, social work, which are those that society probably need most, and COVID showed it, but which are also the less paid and the less recognized. And when they choose uh, careers that can lead to leadership roles or um, strategic positions, then uh, they also uh, are very often heard by the glass ceiling and the fact that a lot of companies lose talent on the way. So it's a key issue today to attract more girls in those um, sectors where they are less represented, and particularly those who have, which have a huge impact on our future, and science and um, innovation are sectors which have a huge impact. It's also a challenge to get more boys being attracted by jobs in care or education or health, because again, it should be diversified everywhere. The problem is that those jobs are not attractive for boys because um, they, there is less to earn than with a career um, in STEM, for example. I don't want to have any more questions. Yeah. So, the slightly depressing part of this is that the gender gap has actually grown in recent years, particularly through the, the COVID period. Um, so in order to um, close the career gender gap, we're currently looking at 132 years. Um, there's a variety of statistics um, which show um, the impact of the, the gender imbalance in the workplace um, without thinking about it further afield. In the interest of time, let's move on to thinking about um, the system which holds all this in place. Um, so while um, it may um, stem from uh, education, it's very much held in place by the role of marketing and media, and um, we all know how influential that is on the, on the lives of, our, of the youngsters um, in, our, in our world the cultural factors that that that's, uh, perpetuates, um, the social norms that we are all um, used to um, up upholding, and then, as we were discussing earlier, how that's written into the law and the politics of the countries we're living, we live in that hold in place the systems within our work environment, um, and also um, 
I think what's been, you know, the positive that's come out of COVID is a recognition of the where the share of the unpaid work is, but then the system's just going round and round. But at the same, so there's no, there's no simple solution to what we're discussing. It's complex and no one has a magic wand. But at the same time, everyone can make a difference and has a responsibility in their own sphere of influence. So we can look at it as an individual, as a collective community, like here in the school, and looking beyond um, into society. So what kind of things can we do as individuals? So we need to think about breaking these biases, smashing the stereotypes that are holding in place, celebrate the role models um, who are going outside of the non-stereotypical -stereo norms, stand up to discrimination when we see it, mind our language. I'm very conscious as the diversity, equity and inclusion coordinator that we're talking a lot about boys and girls and we all need to move on to uh, talking about all genders uh, to include students that don't uh, identify as either male or female. Um, we also need to be thinking about equity in the way we're parenting and sharing domestic tasks, which can be a very difficult conversation. We need to think about challenging gender-based culture, as we saw through the, the videos from the BBC. We also need to be thinking about encouraging extracurriculars where they go, the, the children go beyond the norms. Um, and I say that as a rower who's grown up in a very male-dominated sport. Um, but I credit all those competencies that I learned through competition, uh, risk-taking, um, pushing, being competitive, those are what, what kept me going through uh, the challenges that I faced in life. Um, we also need to be conscious about the transferable skill development. I think every day as my twin daughters go to school and one of the, they both play football and one of them's there every day trying to play football with the boys and the other ones uh, with all the girls um, doing all the, the, the chatting and the socialising and the working at making sure everyone's happy. So I see that on a day to day basis, they're having a very different experience of school. And also as an educator, I see they're developing very different skills with um, one of the, the, the twins, you know, taking that risk to get the ball from the boys, like just trying to move into that space, like take ownership of the space that's so dominated by the boys. Um, they're, so they're developing in very different ways from the, the culture that's um, all around them. So thinking about um, these experiences that your children are having and trying to uh, talk them through what's going on and just because it's normal it's not that it's right um, so that innate we can enable our young people to make more informed choices so systems societies institutions and schools they don't change but people do and it's this process of taking awareness reflecting and determining to make a difference which affects the change there's a Talmudic saying that you're not obligated to complete the work, but nor are you free to desist from it. So my challenge to you adults is what's your little bit of good? Where will you choose to put your energy to make a difference to gender equity? Thank you so much for your attention this evening. <laughs>